Hi, I'm Gregory Blair, and that was the trailer for my film Dead Revisions, which I'll be using for this little video, which I'm calling a directorial tutorial. Which kind of sounds a little poetic and goofy, so if you have a better idea, leave me a comment and let me know. So I'll start off by saying there are many uh, aspects to directing, and uh, I'm not discussing them all today. I'm going to be very specific, more or less. Uh, obviously, a director has to be good at working with actors and be very good at working with uh, the machinery involved, knowing the cameras and etc. And also logistics and administration. Um, and I want to talk specifically about what you actually put on the screen. Uh, and hopefully show why cinema can be a, a, a unique art as opposed to literature or a, another form of art. Because they all have their own unique ways of doing things. Like in, in literature and a novel, you can really get inside a character's head in a way that you can't exactly do uh, with film. But film can do many other unique and interesting things. And so that's sort of what I want to get into. So... There you go. So anyway, Dead the Revisions is a psychological thriller and a valentine to the horror genre. And very briefly, it tells the story of a horror film writer, played by Bill Overs Jr., uh, whose name is Grafton Torn, and he's woken from a coma with no idea how he got there. So he goes to a cabin in the woods to rest and relax and recoup. He enlists a hypnotherapist, and uh, through her... Uh, and some uh, medication, he uh, begins to uh, try to put together the pieces of his missing life. So let's just get into it, huh? <laughs> uh, the first clip I want to show you is uh, when he first goes to the cabin. This is the first time we see the cabin, and it seemed very appropriate to actually, I wanted to do a, a dolly push in. Uh, for multiple reasons. Number one, a dolly push is a very common tool used in cinema, but specifically in horror films, because it's that slow creeping towards something. And I think that that was an important sort of feeling to set the tone for the arrival to the cabin in the woods. And I also wanted to add not just that that emotional sense, but also that actual real physical sense because they are driving up to the cabin. So I wanted to approach so that we had the actual physical sensation similar to what uh, uh, Grafton was having. So, and then finally, of course, the last thing that's great about a dolly push is as you get closer, the object seems to get bigger, you know, and so there's this sort of ominous element to it. So, very typical, but very appropriate. Um, so, take a look. And these next two clips are uh, very specifically uh, revealing a character for Grafton. He's a man who's feeling very small at this point in his life, so I wanted to show that show him feeling small and, and dwarfed by his surroundings. So in this first shot, you'll see he's walking away from us and getting smaller. Uh, you'll also see he has the cane because he's limping, because the, he has a, he's physically crippled, if you will, which goes along with the metaphor of his mental, emotional, kind of crippled state. Um, so he's walking away from us with his cane across this bridge, and there are a few trees and shade in and out, but it still seems like it's a sunny enough day, but he's, he's going in and out of the shadows and looking kind of small. Later in the film, he is, I have a similar shot where he's walking away from us once again, but this time, I let him get smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's much darker and shadier, and there are a whole lot more trees. And instead of holding the shot steady, I let it rise up 
so that he gets smaller in the frame and lower in the frame and the trees sort of surround him. So those two shots work uh, to sort of progress the story uh, and his sort of character arc that he's getting deeper into the woods, metaphorically, if you will. Uh, this next shot is about um, color, which is very important. Uh, the first scene is a Christmas scene, so it's a happy memory. The hypnotherapist has arrived and is trying to get him to remember what he can. So it's a happy scene with him and his wife. It's Christmas, so there's lots of color. The room is full of decorations. It's sort of warm, yellowy color. Um, so there's that. There's nobody goes Caroline anymore. I miss that. CCK has so many kids in it, I want to scream. Well, you chose that project over mine. You knew Candy King Killer would have a lot of kids. I know, but they just don't get killed off fast enough. You know, you have absolutely no maternal instinct at all. <laughs> I married you, didn't I? <laughs> you better run. No! <laughs> So we end with this shot. You can see the room is full of color and light and what have you. And this is almost immediately followed by the first memory he has of discussing divorce. And so we cut to the exact same room, but now it's empty and blue and sterile and cold. And if you look closely, that uh, hearth kind of looks like a monster with those two bright eyes and the nose and that big gaping maw waiting to swallow them up. Anyway, so uh, this next shot is color and light and metaphor. Uh, our hypnotherapist, played by Cindy Merrill, is closing uh, some of the drapes to help darken the room so she can put uh, Grafton under hypnosis. Simple little nothing moment, but watch how it works. So tell me, what do you enjoy doing to relax? Mm, I like to write. Something less active. Read. What do you like to read? You really can't miss that almost the whole thing suddenly seems like it's full of red, which is passion and blood and what have you. The next time when we I have, there's a lot of window and drapery sort of elements. Here's a shot of Grafton now looking out the window at night and the noise he's heard. Uh, whereas You'll recall Cindy completely closes the drapes. Grafton doesn't do that. Grafton just sort of hitches them open so that he can hitch them closed again. Like he's afraid to actually open them and actually be committed to seeing something. Okay, another element I wanted to play with, the windows themselves. Grafton is uh, trying to remember things, trying to recollect. So he's basically, the whole movie, he is reflecting on himself. It's all self-reflection, if you will. So in these uh, windows, uh, these dark windows at night, I have him reflecting on himself a lot. Uh, much more so than him showing up in mirrors, because a mirror is clean and clear, and you can see yourself clearly. But in a window, you see sort of a transparent, ghostly, incomplete image of yourself. So that was way more appropriate and kind of spookier. So anyway, here he is. And then here's another shot, uh, again, of him even closer looking at his ghostly reflection. And this stuff can be used for all kinds of things. Here's another example of the same technique, the, the reflection in the window, but for a totally different reason. Here, uh, Lee's Hart, who plays Cat, is discussing the fact that she has discovered uh, she has a split personality. So the minute she just mentions that there are two of her, Two of her are actually literally physically manifested on the screen in front of us. We actually see two of her. I was having blackouts and it was finally discovered 
that I had a split personality. So that's another metaphoric use of you using your images in your film to say things without actually saying them, just letting them happen. Uh, the wonderful thing about uh, human beings is our eyes will pick it up and we'll see it on some unconscious level. All right, this next scene is uh, Grafton discussing with his friend Dieter, uh, who's come to the cabin and, and comes occasionally to help him out. Grafton has been writing a script while he's at the cabin, and Dieter's been reading it while Grafton's been taking a shower. Grafton is now coming out of the shower dressed, and uh, they have a discussion about the script. And the important thing to watch here is that Dieter, who's, you know, doesn't have memory problems, is pretty much in light the whole scene. Whereas Grafton is in shadow. Half of his face is in shadow. He walks through shadows. And then watch what happens when they end up together. Hey. I was just thinking, if this weren't actually happening to me, I'd make a pretty good movie. What would? My dreams. My past mixed with my movies. She got a writer. All alone, in the cabin, haunted by his own past. It's a pretty good concept for a script. Yeah, it looks that way. Huh? I think you should go back to the hospital. Why? Why? Because this, this isn't healthy. Yeah, it is. I'm remembering things. I can see that. This script that you're writing about you and Kat? What? Is it the truth or are you trying to come up with new memories to replace the ones that you lost? What the hell are you talking about? This, man, what, what is this? I didn't write this. I love that shot where Grafton is completely in profile, which is appropriate because he's only seeing half the picture or he's only half the man he used to be or however you want to look at it. But as he comes up, he completely blocks half of Dieter's face too, which emotionally is just weird and disturbing and, and our, your brain won't necessarily understand what it means. But I think it's an important image that Grafton is blocking Dieter. Our perception of Dieter is being blocked through our unreliable narrator. Or maybe we're just not seeing the full picture of Dieter. It could be anything. It's just this unconscious moment where we have two men and we can only see half of either one of them. So that's a that's another way of uh, using u using your imagery uh, as effectively as you can. Or that was my goal. Then there's other even simpler stuff like we did with the cabin and the approaching of the cabin. When Grafton is having these nightmares, I wanted to make them very horror film ish. So uh, one of the things they do in horror films a lot is camp the camera like that means doing this weird angles and stuff. So I wanted to do that in uh, the film. So a lot of um, those scenes have odd angles. So here's a hooded axe man and Grafton walking down the hall and, and whatnot. All right, here's the last one I want to show you. This is about, now this is about how you can use sound. Sound is extremely important in films. As you know, Grafton is this unreliable narrator. We don't know the memories that we're seeing through his eyes, we don't know if they're real memories or if he has fabricated them. Um, we don't know which is which or if they're a combination. It's, we're really messed up at this point and uh, maybe worse than he is. So he's having a conversation, maybe, <laughs> with a uh, cat again, who's played by uh, Lee's Hart. And they're discussing this. And watch very closely to where the camera is looking when 
people are speaking. What do you think happened? I have an image in my mind of you lying at the bottom of the stairs. Oh, God. Is that why you're torturing yourself? I don't know. Did you think you killed me? Like you killed your hypnotherapist? What did you say? What? What did you just say? Uh, I said, did you think you killed me? No, after that. What did you say? Nothing. I didn't say <laughs> anything. Liar. After... Crap, calm down. I am not going to sit here and let you start that crap all over again. Okay, so if you caught that, when she says, like you killed your hypnotherapist, we are completely focused on Grafton at that moment. So we have no physical, visual verification that she said that. So there's no way to know. We just know we heard it. Did we just hear it because Grafton just heard it? Or did she say it? And you can't know. And that's what makes, I think, that moment really creepy. Because it's creepy that she would say it. But then when he starts yelling at her for it, and she's like, uh, I didn't say anything. You're like, okay. Because it's totally creepy. Because he's he doesn't even know if he has killed his th hypnotherapist. So he has no idea. And so it's just super bizarre. And the only thing that makes it all the more is keeping the camera on him while she talks because then we totally lose verification about what's real and what isn't and we are basically just like Grafton in that moment and you have to decide for yourself what's real and what's not so sound uh what you do with the camera where you place your actors where you place set pieces how they use set pieces all of those things if you can use them not just to uh, tell the basic, you know, this happened, then this happened, then this happened of the story, but use them to reveal character and to express uh, emotion and, uh, and other elements, uh, metaphors, I think uh, then films become much, much richer experiences that way. And you can watch them over and over and over and discover new things each time you watch them. Um, that certainly was my goal with Deadly Revisions. I'll leave you with this. There are several uh, winks to uh, horror film directors in Deadly Revisions. Uh, there's a, there's an, a, at least one wink to Hitchcock, probably a couple. Uh, there's definitely one to Brian De Palma. There's one to uh, Sam Raimi. Um, they're all in there, and but I'm not going to discuss them in this video. <laughs> Maybe I'll give it up in another video, but talk amongst yourselves. I hope that uh, this helped those of you who make films and those of you who watch them to just look for those kinds of things. And uh, in the meantime, keep making films, keep watching them. I'll try to do both with you. All right. Thanks. Hi, so I forgot the ubiquitous obligatory tag. If you enjoyed this video, click the like button. And if you have a question or a comment, leave it below and I'll try to get back to you. All right. Thanks again. Have a good one.